All right. So my name is Charlie Lineweaver, and I was asked to tell a few things about myself before we started talking. And I was born in the U.S., as you might be able to tell from my accent. And let's see, uh, these are three pictures of me. One left when I was in eighth grade, and then here I am in the middle as a soccer player. And on the top, on the right, is me today. So um, who am I? What did, well, I studied a bunch of things in university. I stu first studied history and I played soccer. Then I studied English, French, physics, German, Japanese. I, essentially, I've been in, in a university for my entire life studying things. And uh, German, Japanese, astrophysics, cosmology, exoplanets, and most recently, astrobiology. Um, also, when I was uh, in high school and uh, college, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to be a man of the world and figure out what the world was about, so I traveled to a lot of countries, and I started making a list of the countries I've been to, uh, and then I made some more, and there, here they are. Anyway, I've been to about 60 or 70 countries, and so uh, that's why. Right. So let's talk about, are we alone in the universe? And here's my name, Charlie Lineweaver. I'm at the Planetary Science Institute at the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics. All right, and uh, so are we alone? Well, about four and a half billion years ago, this is what the sun looked like. It was an overdensity in a uh, molecular cloud. And then four and a half billion years later, we have this. So we have a transition from a cold odorless gas to a kangaroo or a life form made out of H and O, C and P, S. That's hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And that's life forms of all kinds are at the 98% level made out of those six elements. And the question we're trying to figure out is how often does that turn into that in the universe? We know we, it happened on our planet, but the question is, has it happened elsewhere? All right, now, I used to teach a course called Are We Alone at the, Uni at the University of New South Wales. And before the course, I would do a survey. And I asked the students, are we alone? And here is the distribution of answers before the course. And that was 10% said, yes, we are alone. 80% said, no, we're not alone. And 10% said, huh, what does the question mean? Well, after the course, I took another survey. And here are those results, and the answer, and you see how yes increased, yes we are alone increased, doubled to 20%, no decreased, and I'm most proud of the fact that 10% more of the students didn't understand the question. And I guess well, part of the theme of tonight's talk will be that we have to understand what this question means if we want to try to answer it, and it's not obvious. It seems obvious, but it's not. So, for example, why do people think that we're not alone? Well, a part of that reason might be because so many people have seen Hollywood movies with aliens like this nine-foot blue, uh, I guess this is Neytiri from the Omatikaya tribe of the Navi people who live on Pandora. <laughs> anyway, it's a planet, a moon around a planet that goes around the star Alpha Centauri, which is the closest star to the sun. Well, actually, it's Proxima. Anyway, if you watch enough of these movies in Hollywood, you think, no, we are not alone. But that, but science is not a democracy. You, this is not how you do science, by asking people what they think. That's how you figure out what our prejudices are, but not what the answer to the question is. So I should also point out that I've done this survey around the world, and in the places I've done it, India has the highest percentage of, no, we are not alone. As a matter of fact, 85 to 95 percent of students in India think that no, we are not alone. Maybe that's because they enjoy the alien movies more than other people. I'm not sure. So in the question, are we alone, what does we mean? And many people, about half of the people I've asked, think we means we humans. So here's a human being. This happens to be Charles Darwin. Now, if you think it's we humans, well, then we know the answer. Are we humans alone in the universe? Well, no, we're not, because we humans are not even alone on Earth. So we know the answer to the question. Here are all the other life forms on Earth. This is a phylogenetic tree. And you can see that the human is not alone. 
So that takes care of the people who think that are we humans alone in the universe? Our closest relatives in the universe are on Earth, and here are some of them. However, if you then say, wait a minute, okay, I don't like that, I'll say, how about we, not we humans, but we, the life on Earth? And when that's the question, it becomes more difficult. Now, I should say that if you have any questions at any part of this talk, just uh, type in the question and they will be relayed to me through a chat window, which is open on my computer now. And so, uh, anyway, just type in those questions if you have any. So, if we, if the, if are we alone, if the we in that question is, we the life forms on Earth, then what is the answer? Well, it's, it's an interesting thing about how changing the identity of the we. So, here's a picture from Scientific American, and there are various tribes here. You can see my arrow, here's one group of hominids, and here's another group here, another group here, and another group over here walking away. There they are. So, Homo sapiens are the only extant hominid on Earth, and therefore we are alone. On the other hand, Homo sapiens are not the only ape, so are we apes alone? No, we're not. We as apes? No, we are not alone. Homo sapiens are not the only primate, or the only mammal, or the only vertebrate on Earth. And that, in that sense, we are not alone. So the answer to the question really does depend strongly on, on what we mean by we. All right. So what about alone? What does alone mean? And I was surprised to find out by asking people that people interpreted this word differently. So for example, if we found microbes on Mars, will we still be alone? Most of the microbiologists and biologists and uh, physicists said, oh yes, so we, 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 they would say, no, we would found life elsewhere, therefore we're not alone. But a lot of people would say, well, wait a minute, I'm not interested in microbes. I can't talk to them. I can't be friends with them. So yes, we would still be alone even if we find microbes on Mars, or for that matter, if we find microbial life anywhere in the solar system or anywhere in the universe. So the, the meaning of the word alone is an important part of this question. Now, are we alone in the universe? That's the question we're trying to answer. And we can also ask, which universe are we talking about? Are we talking about the entire universe? which it looks like from the latest evidence, it might be spatially infinite, or are we only talking about the observable universe, the finite sphere of the uh, universe around us that we can see and, and make contact with? We cannot contact the entire universe, but eventually we may be able to contact the entire observable universe. A lot of people think, wait a minute, that's way too big. I wanna only talk about life in the Milky Way galaxy. For example, the, the uh, the Drake equation talks about how many communicable civilizations are in the galaxy. They're not referring to the observable universe or the entire universe. Now, I'd like to know if that concepts are clear. And if you have a question about that, just ask. Now, so the, the majority of people in the universe, <laughs> the majority of people on planet Earth say, no, we are not alone. And when people say that, I say, why? What are your reasons? What, what evidence do we have suggesting that we are not alone? And uh, well, some evidence is the following. There, are, there seem to be a lot of Earth-like planets. As a matter of fact, there are probably 10 to the 22 in the observable universe. And the universe looks like it's spatially infinite, so that's a lot. <laughs> Maybe, and that might mean that there are an infinite number of Earth-like planets in the universe, and therefore, there may be an infinite number of places uh, with watery planets on which uh, life could get started. Now, I wanted to show you a little bit about some of the progress we've been making in finding exoplanets. Uh, just as a historical perspective, if we asked this question about 50 years ago, scientists, real scientists, true scientists, hardcore scientists, they would say, this is not a scientific question. Why? Because we have no data. We don't have any 
extraterrestrials in our laboratory that we can talk to or communicate with, and we don't know any other planets. Well, now that has changed. In 1995, the first extrasolar planet was detected, and here is a plot we made in 2012 of all the planets, exoplanets. These are planets orbiting other stars that had been detected. And just to show, and here you can see the Earth is right here, and there's Venus, and there's Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. That's where our solar system is. Here is where we've detected a lot of planets, and but that those are the easiest ones to detect with the highest masses and the shortest periods. Here's 365 days, for example, and here's 88 days, and most of them are sh very short periods, and they're very massive. Now, have a look at this next slide, and it will show you how much progress has been made in the in well from 2012 to 2016 in four years and it got it has gone from this to this and so a lot more planets now here we are in 2020 so probably on the order of about 4,000 planets have been detected notice however that the uh, the selection effects the bias of the observations is still towards the upper left of this diagram that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of planets around the planets in our solar system. It's just that the type of planets we live in, or the type of planets in our solar system, are harder to detect than the ones we've been able to detect so far. Okay, so based on the statistics and our knowledge of how, what type of planetary systems we have uh, been looking at, we can estimate that every star probably has some type of planetary system. And that's what this diagram represents, planets around every star. So if you go out tonight and look out at a star, that star probably has some type of planetary system around it, but we probably haven't detected any yet, just because our observations are not good enough, not comprehensive enough, and uh, we're unable to look at planets that are very small, like the Earth, for example. Another reason why you might say, no, we're not alone, is that in the past few decades, not only have we found lots and lots of exoplanets, that's the yellow dot here on the left, extra, extraterrestrial environments known to exist, whoa, we found lots and lots of them, so this yellow oval has gotten very big. But also here on Earth, we have studied more and more about the life on Earth, and we found that, wow, life exists in a much larger range of environments than we had known before. And so the hope is that this blue circle is getting bigger and the yellow circle is getting bigger, then there should be an overlap between these extraterrestrial environments in yellow and the types of conditions that we know, at least on Earth, life has been able to adapt to. Okay. So that's our hope, but notice we have not found any life elsewhere yet, and that's what we're looking for. And I suspect, though, that uh, we will find life or we will find something on these other planets because in the next five to ten years, a lot of new instruments will be focused and targeting the uh, nearest Earth-like planets. So. One other thing we should, that goes into this thinking about are we alone is that in 1953, there was an experiment called the Yuri Miller experiment. And what he was able to do in this simple water vapor, heat it up, have electrodes into an environment, into an atmosphere with methane and ammonia and hydrogen, they were able to pull out here amino acids. And these are the building blocks of life and they can easily be made in the laboratory. And not only that, but the building blocks of life fall from the sky. This is a piece of the Murchison meteorite. And uh, what that tells us is that the chemicals that we're made of, the things that my head is made of, the skin, for example, and this finger, these are made out of proteins. Proteins are made out of amino acids, and amino acids fall from the sky and can be easily made in a reducing atmosphere. So that the, the ingredients for life are everywhere on earth 
And particularly in the early earth, when there was a heavy bombardment and lots more things were falling from the sky because the inner part of the solar system had not been emptied out by the gravitational attraction of planets for all the dust and debris and gases that are in the accretion disk of young stars when they're forming. So the bottom line here is ingredients are everywhere, but what about their recipe? How about the rest? How specific is the recipe? Do you just take all these ingredients, push them together, and then you get life? Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. So we, do, but we don't know much about the recipe needed. We can't make life in the laboratory yet. I'm not sure we'll ever be able to do that. And until we do, it'll be very hard to figure out the probability of life. Even if we have, even if the ingredients are abundant, and we're very sure that they are abundant because the elements that are the most abundant on Earth are the same that are the most abundant in our sun. And by looking at the spectra of other stars, we can verify that those are the same elements that are abundant elsewhere in the universe, everywhere in the universe, not just in our solar system, not just in our galaxy, but in all the galaxies we see. So the, the statement ingredients are everywhere applies to the entire universe and I'm pretty confident to the entire, the entire universe, not just the entire observable universe. As for the recipe, we're not quite sure. <laughs> okay. And here's the, the universe. It's very big. And I wanted to talk to you about one other piece of evidence that's relevant to trying to answer the question, are we alone? And that is, this, here's our galaxy here, and our galaxy is 100,000 light years from here to here across. Now, if, if, if us or another civilization make a rocket ship that could travel at about 10% the speed of light, well then you can do the calculation and that figures out that how long will it take you to go from one end to the other of a galaxy at 10% the speed of light? And the answer is here, a million years. It takes a million years to go from here to here if this were our galaxy. Now that's interesting because how old is this galaxy? Well, the galaxy is 10 billion years old. So that we can ask the question, in the 10 billion year history of our galaxy, how many times could a rocket ship go back and forth and back and forth? And so the math is kind of simple. You divide 10 to the 10, by 10 to the 6, which is a million years, and then you get 10 to the 4. So what that 10 to the 4 means is that if there was a civilization that learned how to make a rocket ship that could go 10% the speed of light, and they had evolved very early in the history of our galaxy, then they could have gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, forth 10,000 times in the history of our galaxy. And so, that begs the question, well, when we look around on Earth, we see skulls like this. We don't see any aliens. We don't see any sign that uh, aliens have colonized our Earth before we came. When we use our best radios to listen for extraterrestrial intelligence, we don't hear anything. We just have silence. And so where is everybody? And this is known as the Fermi paradox. If you assume that life starts on some of these planets and that life eventually leads to technological life, what you would call a civilization, then there's no reason why they couldn't colonize the galaxy and yet we don't see them. And that is the Fermi paradox. Where is everybody? Now, you might want to interpret that and say, well, there's, there is not anybody. <laughs> Nobody's out there. We are the only technological civilization in the universe, maybe. And uh, maybe that's true. We do not know. Now, so here are all the stars and some of the stars in our galaxy. And the question is, hello, is anybody out there? Now, here's a cartoon that kind of just, it's a message that demonstrates, oh, it kind of makes fun at our search for life elsewhere. Here are two ants, and no, ants, they, they smell things. We've searched dozens of these floor tiles for several common types of pheromone trails. If there were intelligent life up there, 
we would have seen its messages by now. And uh, so these are the conversation as the world's first ant colony to achieve sentience calls off the search for us. So if we do find aliens, will they eat us? Or will they help us join the Federation of Galactic Civilization? Or will we kill ourselves before then? We don't know. So I'd like to summarize this talk is in the question, um, are we alone? It's important to know what do we mean by we? If we mean we humans, then the answer is simple. We are not alone. We humans are not alone on earth. Therefore, we are not alone in the universe. If the question becomes, are we the life on earth alone in the universe? Well, then it becomes a more difficult question. But I should point out that the word life, we don't have a good definition of that. We're not sure what life is. For example, our virus is alive. I've gone around the world and, and talked to biologists. And I, whenever I hear see a biologist, I say, our viruses are alive. Our virus is alive. And the, uh, the responses are, the, the first time I just tried to uh, categorize the responses, it was essentially half of them said yes and half of them said no. But as I asked more and more, I got dozens and dozens and dozens of biologists ans asked to answer the question, are viruses alive? There, about a quarter of them would say yes, and a quarter of them would say no. A quarter would say, that's not a well-defined question. And the quarter would say, that doesn't matter. It's not an important question. <laughs> and so that tells you the, the status of what we know about viruses and what we know about the definition of life if biologists cannot agree on what life is. One question you might ask is, do we need to know what life is to answer the question, are we alone? And I'm not quite sure that's the case. It seems that we do not know what life is, and that would make the, the uh, just as we don't know what who we is, we, um, if we don't know what life is, maybe we've already detected life. For example, some physicists think that, uh, oh, life could be a hurricane or a convection cell or a fire, and if that's your definition of life, then we've found those things on other planets. Then there is the more subjective, what does alone mean? And uh, well, uh, I don't know what alone means. It means different things to different people. Uh, if we find, I think if we find life on Mars, even microbial life, I think that that will mean that we are not alone. Uh, but that's my personal opinion and I'll stick with it. Now, that's the end of the talk. And if you have any questions, please chat, type them in now and I can wait and I will wait for a little while. But while I'm waiting, I thought I'd talk about, I thought I'd ask my own questions. For example, is the question, are we alone, an important question? And I think it is. And, uh, but you might ask, well, is it or not? When, when I think the, the movie, what was the movie, Contact? where people, we, we found ex, intelligent extraterrestrials and then the whole world changed. For some people and others, they just, uh, they just said, wow, and then went on with their business. I, I just wanted to tell you a story. One, I was interviewing people about, uh, you know, I said, if I gave you $100 billion with the caveat that you had to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? And a lot of astronomers, would say, I would spend it on really fancy new telescopes. A lot of planetary scientists said, oh, I would spend it on sending missions to Mars. Um, a lot of SETI people, this is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, would say, I would send, I would, uh, I would buy more radio telescopes and, uh, and look, listen more carefully to the whole universe. But one student in India, he said, uh, I would spend $100 billion on poverty reduction programs. And I said, what? why would you do that? And he pointed out something very fundamental, and that is, if you want to answer the question, are, you, are we alone, you have to stay alive 
And it's not obvious to me that humans will stay alive. We might kill ourselves. We are the first generation in the last hundred years. Humans have learned how to how to kill ourselves, and we may be may do that, and that would be too bad because that would prevent us from answering this question. So that's why investing a hundred billion dollars in poverty programs is not silly. Okay, we have a question here. It says, "Do you think it's likely that another civilization would share our interests in exploration, or that we would recognize their signals for what they are? Could we just be missing it?" Well. First of all, do you think it's likely that another civilization would share our interests in exploration? Well, in Darwinism, it seems to be a truism that if you want to go extinct, you should uh, stay on one small island. Do not spread out. And so if you want to guarantee the survival of any particular species or life form, you should have them spread out to different islands or different continents. And this is something that Elon Musk thinks is appropriate for us because he thinks we should become a multi-planet species specifically so we can avoid extinction. For example, if there's World War III or World War IV or World War V, it's possible that we could kill ourselves. But if we have, in the meantime, established colonies on the moon or on Mars, something that we hope to do in the next 5, 10, 20 years, there's this window of opportunity now where we can do that. And if we do that, the people who will be the colonists on the moon and the Mars will be immune to that type of extinction from World War I on the Earth, unless, of course, the war spreads to the moon. So um, let's see. Do you think it's likely that another civilization would share our interest in exploration? The reason I mention this is because if there is a if Darwinian evolution selects for proliferation and exploration, not only for conscious creatures, but for other things. I mean, when you have a plant and it makes its seed pod, it makes its seeds pod specifically so that they spread all over the place. As a matter of fact, that's what fruit is for. Fruit was constructed by plants so animals would come, eat it, and then defecate and carry the seeds further away and then defecate. And so that was the method to spread. In some sense, that's the type of exploration. You're spreading your species out. Um, as to whether we would recognize the signals for what they are, um, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it, what, you're, what you're asking about is what is a signal and what is noise? And that is something that's surprisingly difficult to answer. For example, their, the first Jocelyn Bell found the first uh, pulsars. And she, and she labeled them little green men. And the idea was, wow, these are pulses. Nature doesn't create pulses, but human, artificial intelligence does. But then we figured out, wait, may, nature does this. Now, the problem with the, with the dichotomy that I just made between artificial and natural is something that I don't really subscribe to. In other words, how do you identify artificial signals? Everything humans do, you could say is artificial, but I would say it's also natural. Now, uh, so could we just be missing the signals? Yes, of course. But I would also say that maybe we don't know what life is, and maybe we don't know the difference between natural and artificial, and therefore it, we're bound to miss the signals <laughs> because maybe we're making a false dichotomy between artificial intelligence and natural intelligence, and there is none to be made. Okay, somebody comments, alone might include interaction, not just existence. Yes, they said two people may live in the same space, but may, they, may, they may be alone if there is no interaction. That's right, and that's why most people on, I would say maybe even most people on Earth believe that if we discover microbes on Earth, I'm sorry, if we discover microbes on Mars that have an independent evolution from our life, then we would still be alone because what kind of interaction can there be? Well, I'm not, I don't subscribe to that because there could be all kinds of interaction between us and microbes. Matter of fact, that's what the COVID-19 pandemic is, an interaction between viruses and human beings. 
you, I have a dog and there's an interaction between the dog. Some people are satisfied with that interaction and they feel not alone when the dog is there. Other people would say, no, I need a human being. Not only do I need a human being, I need a, need a human being who can speak the same language and who shares the same interest and maybe the same religion. You can get arbitrarily specific about your requirements for feeling not alone. That's why it's arbitrarily subjective and hard to make an answer to. So, um, those are the questions, and there, are, there seem to be no other questions. So I will sign out, wishing you to stay alive, because that's the only way we're going to be able to answer the question, are we alone? We need to stay alive. <laughs> so, thank you for listening.